Good, so we're just getting ready now. Uh, I think we'll be in any second. So uh, let me just keep an eye on the group. Good, well, we're in. We're in. Good. Hello, everyone. <laughs> it's always a little bit behind, isn't it? So uh, I'm always rubbish at the beginning. People know that, so they keep looking at me. So that's great. Uh, hi, hi. So, hi, Linda. Good to see you. Same to you. Thank you so much for coming along uh, to have a chat with us all tonight. And uh, we've got a lot to kind of go over. Um, so, uh, and I think it's going to be one of those chats like when we've chatted before, it could go anywhere. So we'll just yes. see how that goes. But I'm really keen for us to learn a lot about your, your kind of journey and your outlook and your passion. Uh, and um, there is definitely something happening at the moment, I think. Uh, I, yeah. I don't know whether you see it where finally some bits of the jigsaw start start to fall into place and uh and that could be because we're able to connect like we are now maybe maybe that is the thing that we needed but it, what's been really important is that we recognize the voices and i call them the authentic voices mm -hmm. that have been talking in these terms for a long time and that is definitely yourself and of course your mother um uh, so just for those listening then linda tell us a little bit about your journey and about your your kind of yeah your journey into where you are now yeah of course I grew up with my mom and she's been a dog trainer consultant for 50 years now last year so so I've been in it all the time but I, I've been a glorified assistant <laughs> I've been a test person and a gopher and uh, everything like that and uh, I, I never pursued a career as a dog trainer I was just there helping out and um, <clears throat> I lived with my mother on the farm for a long time. So I was in the thick of it most of the time. And I, I saw the, the coming to be of the calming signals and uh, how they documented it. And uh, I was to and fro. I was living all the places, but I always came home in weekends or uh, every other week. And uh, it's been a very fun journey. And uh, after some time, when everything around me started to cool down with kids and everything. So, well, dog training is kind of fun, but um, I'm not that much of a dog trainer. I'm more of a dog interpreter or translator or investigator, if you want. Love because those I, terms. Yeah. I, I always try to find the whys. And if people tell me you have to do this and this, and I say, why? And the dog is so-and-so, you have to fix them. But why is it like that? What's going on in his head? Why is he thinking like that? And um, was, was that influenced by your mother, or had there been other life experiences and other things that you'd gone through that also came came to allowed you to come to that conclusion? Absolutely, it's my mother first of all, but uh, also my training as a teacher, and I've been working a lot with uh, special needs children. I've been working as a kindergarten teacher with also children that has no language. Uh, I've been a mother of two and they also had their issues. <laughs> and I, I tried to understand what is this coming from? What is their motivation? And uh, it, it's sort of just fitted together, everything with children and dogs and learning psychology and how the process of the mind works. So um, <clears throat> it got me curious. So I wanted to learn more. So I take some courses and I go to a dog trainer school and I take some more courses. <laughs> and uh, the, you know, the more you know, the more you realize how little you know. For because sure. th this is a vast field. And if somebody tell, tell you that I know everything because I'm an expert, I said, okay, you don't know. <laughs> and I think that's really interesting. I think um, <clears throat> so many people listening as well who uh, have come from a similar background, whether it's working with children, children with special educational needs, whether it's people coming from a humanities background, teaching background. It's amazing how that really makes you think more about what behavior is and, and that shift away from the arbitrary nature of thinking well that behavior is bad therefore we must change it rather than mm -hmm. thinking as you say the whys yeah we've got loads of whys to explore and i want to unpack those but i'm really interested because 
your mum's too Rugas, right? Okay. Yep. So, uh, and only you can say that uh, in this kind of virtual space. Yes. So, not afraid. I'm not ashamed. <laughs> no, you're not ashamed. No, of course. No, it's a really amazing thing. This is what I'm saying. I, I find it really interesting to think that uh, to have the early influence from your mum and to actually be there whilst some of those kind of moments were happening for your mum where she was thinking, whoa, hang on a minute. Mm. something happening here i'm seeing yeah. things here that must have been so amazing uh, to be a part of that experience because of course we see all that in the form of a book you know yes. the final product of that but um it must have been an amazing time to be around your mom when she was really thinking hang on i'm seeing things here i'm making some connections yes and um, maybe the most amazing about my mom is that um she discovered the calming signals and she continue to study the dog signals but also she keeps on evolving she keeps on reading she takes keeps on taking classes she started reading a book of quantum physics for beginners and laughed her head off. of course she understood it <laughs> and she's she's been reading up on brain chemistry for fun at the age of 80 i mean uh, she's so keen on learning and understanding and uh, to continue that process, I think is the most important thing we can do. That we don't just sit back and say, "Okay, I learned a lot now. I'm happy." And that's really important because I, I think a lot of I, I heard um, it's probably about two years ago when I heard your mother uh, speak um, virtually um, on recording, and it was pretty clear that I think some people look at, especially if they've got like um, you know the early books. They, they might think that that's where Turi ended, but obviously that was just the beginning and things have shifted a lot. And even for her own personal development, um, you know, uh, she's continued to evolve with those, those views. And also I was talking to my daughter today, she's 29, and uh, she's a daycare for a small dog. And uh, I told her something about something that she did not, we don't do that anymore. And she said, geez, mom, you taught me this when I was a child. I said, yeah, but we keep on learning. You have to yeah. be in the loop. You have to continue. <laughs> so, oh, so everything I was taught as a child is obsolete. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> and and that was after the calming signals because we keep on moving. We keep on educating ourselves. And, and that is... <laughs> more or less an obligation I think as somebody who has to do with others minds if it's people or if it's dogs and that's the thing when we because I, I, I kind of talk in, in reference to the emotional experience what that is mm -hmm. and, and what we know is that whilst we all have one it is unique to us and I think even in human uh, therapy circles human psychology circles where we have um, a lot of different disciplines that come together to give us an understanding we're still just a fraction of understanding the human condition, oh, yeah. the consciousness, all these kind of aspects, let alone us trying to step into the emotional experience of another species, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be something that's going to keep evolving. And this is what's exciting about thinking about things differently, because I think some of the more traditional focus on the how, how do we change that behavior yeah. it, it can lead into a bit of a cul-de-sac if you're not careful yes yes whereas when you start asking the whys it's just this never-ending kind of uh um horizon in front of you where you just keep learning and, and adapting when you came back from uh so you so you had that opportunity to be there when your mom was looking at these things and then you went off uh did your own thing um which we'll touch on upon in a, in a moment actually because i think there's some really relevant aspects there but when you came back around and you thought right actually i think now i am going to start to think about working with dogs uh some of what you draw drew in yourself then did you find that you had things that you were able to offer to your mother uh that she was able to think wow i hadn't thought about that uh well, she usually had thought about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm kind of an inferior mind right? there. <laughs> it's very frustrating. Yeah. Uh, I have maybe taught her some snippets, but uh, that's minor. That's just the bullish. She, she's you, been there already. <laughs> did you find when you were working in education, because uh, I know 
coming into the dog world and looking, listening to a lot of the discussions we're having now, I know that um, I remember the same kind of discussions going on in my human therapy days, uh, and also within child education, especially, especially with children who have various challenges. You have the different camps and you have the different outlooks and things. Mm -hmm. Were you aware of when you came into the dog world, were you able to think, wow, that's really connected to some of the things that I experienced while I was going through the child educational side of your career? Oh, actually, it was the other way around. I went to the teacher's academy and I didn't have to read at all because I knew all the shit from before. <laughs> Sorry, my mouth again. Uh, no, but actually it was uh, quite easy. We were taught about Maslow, Skinner, uh, Pavlov, and so on. I, I knew that. I've been training dogs. <laughs> yeah. so. did, did you find the kind of um, the environment you were in with the children? That, uh, that really, that, that, with, with the kind of setup that you were in, the kind of environment you were in, the culture you were in, was it very much geared towards trying to support the outlook and emotional need of the children or? Yes, it yeah. was. And uh, it, it's long ago, we stopped making children perform. I mean, you don't take a child into a strange family and say, oh, sing them a song, show how you can dance, stand on your hands. Now sit still and be quiet while the grown-ups talk. We don't do that anymore. We haven't done that for 30 years. But uh, with dogs, it seems to be a different story. And, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, so many people are so hung up in showing other people what they can do. They stop doing it with their children because their children needs the freedom to explore and to find their own way and their own identity. But with the dogs, it's still sit, stay down. So it's, I don't see how not more people have drawn the connection there. What do you think is, uh, I've got my own thoughts on this, but um, what do you think is the reason for that? Why is it that we have an industry or a part of our industry that seems to not see some of these extra bits or, or are hesitant to, to shift how they view things or how they practice? Because it's so flipping easy to train a dog, to, to get a dog to do stuff. It's so easy. It's a scavenger, trees are food, food is survival. It's so easy, he will do anything. And uh, even if you don't know his motivation or his fears or his hesitations, it, he will still do it for food and for love. Yeah. And as long as you have love and food, you can make him do anything. But I don't see that as a reason to do it. That you can is not a reason to do it. You should think, why do I want to do him, him to do that? Why do I need him to stand on my shoulders, jump through hoops, so on? Is, is it valuable for the dog? Does he enjoy it or is he just trying to please me? Or is it just doing it for survival, which is the treats and the food? So when you look at, um, when you have the people that come and uh, learn with you, do you find that because they've obviously sought you out, that some of those barriers aren't necessarily there? Or do you still find that you have to invite them to shift some of that belief system to kind of really connect with what it is you're doing, as opposed yeah. to maybe just kind of thinking, oh, that's cool, but not actually get it? Yeah, no, it's, it's both, it's both. And uh, some people know what I'm doing when they seek me out and some have no idea. They just come and uh, want to have a better dog. <laughs> and, and some, most actually get it. When I, when I sit down with them and try to figure out what they're expecting and uh, try to talk with them about what is actually a realistic expectation and what is actually realistic for the dog to understand about your motivation. And, um, Sorry. And uh, I, I also try to have them see the dog and see how wonderfully easy it is if you just connect with the dog and you can live a life together as 
maybe not equal, but at least as partners. And he, he can have choices, he can have options, and he can have a say in what his life is going to be. That doesn't mean he's running wild. It means that you can sit back, kick off your shoes from time to time, uh, and just take it a little bit easy. Because you don't have to train him for everything. He knows how to walk. He knows how to find you. He knows how to lay down and sleep if he needs to. You don't have to train him to do it. Yeah. So uh, if you just can find that uh, more like Zen, I I'm, I'm very hesitant to use words like, uh, like Zen or um, holistic or <laughs> anything like that because uh, I'm not into the mind reading or anything. It's all about seeing what is actually there. But um, but it kind of resonates a little bit. <laughs> with, with and I think that's a good point there because it, is, it can be hard. Oh, I don't really heard that. My dog's just doing a big burp. It wasn't me with the dog. Um, the, it, it can be hard. Language is so important, right? Uh, and language has definitely been used to frame uh, the more traditional view of doing things because uh, whether that's the very the kind of dominance model stuff or even the, even the more uh, do, do kind of positive reinforcement training language is is really important and, and that's why i hate be... the word industry dog training industry it really grates on my nerves <laughs> what is it about the word industry that grates it's like just pumping out easy solutions <laughs> mm. oh yeah i see that i hate that <laughs> well i think we have ended up, when we think about the progression, I'm giving a talk on Monday and I've had to break down the kind of history of dog training, if you like, and just see mm -hmm. how it goes through. Um, you can see how, obviously we started off with a very kind of authoritarian view of how we train dogs, even mm -hmm. before the whole dominance pack thing came along. When that did come along, it kind of fitted with that. So it was quite connected and it kind of went through that process. But even the early pioneers, you know, your John Fishers and others who will hang on, that's just a bit harsh. Let's think about doing things differently. It was still very much on that linear progression of looking to change and manipulate behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, and so a, an industry has been built around that. And I think mm -hmm. I, I get what you mean about that now. And, and it's very easy to monetize that actually and mm. to get the right language to support that which also from my point of view i'm interested in the, the psychology of judgments and value systems and all this mm. kind of thing it can fit very easily with a human need or or tendency to just be, have a very quick judgment of behavior yeah. because it's easy for our brain to think that's bad that's good and also uh, i, like I that. think the, the human need for worship this uh, insatiable craving for having somebody look up to you with admiration and worship that is such a great way of thinking about it and i think uh you know um i use the term validation which is a bit a bit soulless i know but worship yeah. is a good word i think because we all want to feel validated right we all want to feel worth mm -hmm. and especially you know if we just look at especially the, um, the structured educational system that we have where we are expected to act in a certain way and look a certain way we're often pitted against our peers in order to attain the notion of success that has actually been arbitrarily decided by others yeah. it can be really hard to find that sense of self and i think this is the the kind of um uh, kim brophy talks about this mm. about how on the one side the reason we have our dogs is so we can have that unconditional love and we want to have that kind of uh, like say hero worship kind of connection but it's and not yet, unconditional well this is the point but on the flip side um we expect so much mm. and we kind of almost the things that we want by doing some of the things that we've done more traditionally are actually diluting that attainment or that that possibility of that relationship when, when you look at it i mean dog training is a fairly new thing when I was a child, there wasn't much dog training at all. The jo dogs were just there. You had them in the family and you would take to them for a walk or you could just let them loose and uh, let them run around the neighborhood. And then came the more uh, linear thinking and uh, the dog is subservient and you, you should always be the boss of the dog. And then came the pack and dominance theories and do as the wolf mother does. Then they've seen a wolf mother. I'm 
hundred percent sure. And uh, and then uh, came the mixed. Oh, you can uh, treat a little bit and say or praise a little bit, and, uh, and then say no. And then came the uh, oh, operants with a oh, we can fix anything, but we're so nice because we do it with treats and praise and kind voices, and uh, it's still the same thing. Actually, there. Uh, the main goal is to mold the dog to fit our needs. And uh, it's a very little concern about the dog's needs, even if you say so. And that's a really good Sorry. point. And, and, and this is how I frame it with, we've definitely moved on because we're doing things nicer, but we haven't necessarily moved forwards. And I think mm. that moving forwards is what where we're at now, thinking about these yeah. things. And, um, yeah. and also, um, uh, uh, sorry, brain's gone now. I had a really good point then. Never mind. Back over to you, Linda, while my brain gets back into gear. <laughs> yeah, no, no. What actually surprises me is that very many people still do the operant and uh, they think of it as cutting edge modern dog training. It was cutting edge 30 years ago, or maybe 25 years ago. That was really cutting edge. I, I did it 30 years ago. And um, that was the first thing my daughter saw <laughs> in her first years. And that, that was operant. And then we evolved. We learned more things. We had more studies. We had more ideas. And we connected with more people. And that is, I think, crucial that we connect with people and we listen to others, not only the ones who agrees with us all the time, but also others, because everybody has a point, even if that point is, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and that's important because I think um, I've learned myself, especially in the last kind of couple of years where I've had a chance to connect to a quite a wide range of different people, mm -hmm. not just within dogs, by the way, I, I've tried to link in with people from different disciplines because I think yeah. there's, there's a truth in all of them. Uh, and even if we, hear something that actually we think actually that just doesn't fit my value system or doesn't fit my outlook. Even that's important that we hear it because at least we've gone through a little bit of reappraisal of our own value there. Yes. I thought actually, no, I'll stick with that. And I think the whole point of cognitive reappraisal, we know this again with the brain, that the brain doesn't like to do it very much. That's why we have our fixed <laughs> value and belief system and we, we defend it with our biases. It's so um, safe. This is so safe. It's so safe. And I think this is where some of the people that I've spoken to who have been a bit cautious about some of the kind of conversations that are going on mm -hmm. uh, is that they are that those defense systems are kicking in a little bit rather than allowing. A, let me just think if there's something for me to reappraise here. The point I was going to make a minute for out of brain freeze was something you said about about. Um, uh, still being fixed on the kind of the how and kind of giving a nod to the emotional side of things because I think the there is a big difference between recognizing a dog's current emotional state mm. and actually understanding their emotional need and experience yes, because yes. Um, and this is something again I hear a lot from people who might have heard some of the Beyond the Operant series or other conversations mm. uh, and especially who have a heavy operant outlook who then get a bit upset because they feel that somehow people are saying they don't care about the emotions. But if you're working with a dog um, and you're it's aware so of their emotional state in the moment, that's that's one thing. But if you still, if you then stop that because you think, yeah, the dog's getting stressed or the dog can't cope, but then later you still go back and work to the same criteria you set before, you're not necessarily recognizing that dog's emotional experience, I think. No, no. no actually, uh... The, the dog's emotional experiences, what we do, that, 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 that's what we work with. But uh, I've, I've been trying to explain this so many times and I, I still haven't found the word that can penetrate through minds, I think, because uh, we so often tend to distract the dog, to make the dog think about something else, to make positive associations with a bad situation. But actually, the dog has so many coping strategies. He has so many life skills that he just needs to find. And that's what we're training, actually. That's a training we do. If the dog is reactive, 
first of all, why is he reactive? Is he in pain? Is he afraid? Blah, blah, blah. Then we go to eventually what is the pain? Uh, does he need a vet? Does he need a myotherapist? What can we do about his exercise regime? The way they play, the way and how long they walk, and so on and so on. You go to the bottom of, of the course chain and we work your way up. And when you have sorted out the environmental, the physical, and the emotional needs, when you got that part of the jigsaw puzzle, then you can start working on behavioral skills. You can start with um, being with all the mature dogs that can show him how the body language works, how the calming signals work. And he will get that empowerment of seeing how he can make all the dogs change their behavior by the way he is using his. Because when we all the time modify and distract and don't give the dog thing, time to think or concentrate, he will lose his language because you only give him the one option to have his focus on you and not about what is going around in the environment. And when he don't know what is going on in the environment, he doesn't feel safer because he's with you. He, he can shut it out, but it doesn't give him any quality skills. He will feel so much empowered when you let him find his skills in a safe environment. And it's not about just tossing the dog into a difficult uh, situation and let him figure it out. It's about uh, actually a step-by-step -step training with a very safe environment that you can gradually uh, decrease <laughs> until it's um, it, it, while he's still on top of it, while he still has the ability to cope. And if it's too much, if it starts showing signs of stress, you go and do one of his skills. If it's curving, if it is using things, people, anything as a barrier, if it's turning his side, either way, they have preferences for sides. <laughs> and uh, also which way to curve, actually. And uh, maybe some dogs want to sniff the ground while they look uh, sideways. They have much wider range of sight than we have, but they often have a blind spot uh, just before them and uh, <clears throat> there's so many skills that a dog can use and we don't let him when we say look at me look at me i'll give you treats i give you treats you rob the dog of so many options and you don't make him feel happy or give him good vibes or associations he seems happy and he kind of is better off because you distract him from what he's reacting to and you're doing something he likes, mainly eating, and, and he feels okay, but he doesn't acquire those skills. Did that make sense to you? Oh, 100%, because that, this is uh, this is the very much the nature of a lot of the strands that I'm trying to pull together with dog center care, you know, mm -hmm. about looking at this, because and I think you, you, know, you actually explained that beautifully, and especially that little bit at the end, because we can, of course, step in, we can micromanage, we can get the dog to do a lot of things on cue, um, and we might be able to get through situations. What we have to understand, though, without judgment, is just recognizing that potentially many of those behaviors that we get the dog to do may have no internal value to them. Yes. And definitely when we think about, I like the terms that I, I pull from human psychology support of self-regulation as opposed to dysregulation. Yes. If we're looking for a dog to truly get to a point that they can self-regulate, that they can process, go through that elevation, decompression. And I love how you were talking about the weaves and the turns because I call that orientation. And, and, and uh, actually all mammals, we, we instinctively want to orientate to feel safe. Mm. dogs big time do uh, and uh, so no I think this is the, what we have to think about this is the shift this is us thinking yes we can do that and we can get some success from that success from our point of view because mm. the behavioral output has changed but we haven't necessarily truly changed that dog's innate way to cope and this is my personal issue with terms like 
um, like uh, like conditioning and counter conditioning and yeah. and these kind of things. I think we have to ask the question: What are we actually countering? What are we actually putting in? Are we actually seeing a shift in that dog where the dog's like, "Oh, right, actually, that kind of really works for me," and I can go through my normal elevation, decompression, threat evaluation process and deal with it, or are we just getting them to do something else? We are that getting, is, that is conditioning. Yeah, we're making them even more dependent on us. And if that dog meets something that he's reacted to later without you being there, maybe he's with a dog walker because you were taken ill and he will have absolutely no clue if not that person does exactly the same thing as you do. And he, ha he will have no way of showing others how to behave because he doesn't know himself. So, uh, so I think uh, the main success story on this counter conditioning is that you, oh, you get the dog to look at you. You feel you have control. And it makes you feel good to have control. And I get that. I like to have control. I like to have control over my dogs, my cats, my children, my co-workers, my whole working space, my kitchen. I, I want it all <laughs> in my control. But somewhere you have to give and mm. take into consideration that this is living beings. They also have a right to their own minds and coping skills. If I just run the whole show all the time, everybody would be so stupid and so helpless. And we see this with humans when we think about anything that forms uh, an institutionalization process, somebody who becomes institutionalized, whether that is within a facility, whether it's because they've been in the services, even people who have been on uh, supported benefits for a period of time can almost be institutionalized in a, in a way where uh, when that stops and there is an element of having to look at self-help, self-regulation, having to be able to deal with these pressures, it can be very difficult to because so many other decisions and choices have been made on your behalf up yes. until that point. So we can all recognize that actually and I think... Exactly and that, that is what, what I call we all know that learned helplessness uh, can be achieved by commands and uh, punishment and making you afraid of what can happen if you don't do as I say. But I think learned helplessness is also when somebody else takes control, even if it's with lots of treats and love and good intentions, it still creates learned helplessness. And that is not a good feeling. It's not and this is why I, I, it's not, and I think you explain things so well, and, and um, no, <laughs> you do though, but you do know, I think, well, yeah, you do, uh, because it just gets my, yeah, you get my, when we've spoken before, my brain goes 100 miles an hour when you say things, and because each little bit, this is what I love about these discussions we're having within, within this kind of moment, hopefully movement that's going on with everybody talking is because you unpack one bit and there's another three things to unpack right because yeah, every, yeah. every little bit is oh my god a bit more a bit more it gets you thinking yeah. and i think I this is the... i get so excited when i see these talks you have with other people and i, I sit almost shouting at the screen oh but i have something to say about that but of course i've forgotten that now <laughs> and that's the thing I, I think that we're going to be having people doing that while we're talking as well i think i know um yeah yeah when it happens and i definitely when i uh um uh Kim got a got chance to speak to Simon uh, Gabois recently and I couldn't make it. I was supposed to be in that chat. Uh, and when I watched it afterwards, I thought, oh my God, I wish I was there because I want to ask this and I want to ask that. But we need more forms like this. One thing I've been thinking about with Dog Centre Care, the group actually, mm -hmm. is to start having maybe monthly forums of maybe 10 people yeah. uh, where we can all come together and uh, just take, you know, just kind of draw names yeah, out of the hat really if more people yeah. want to. So we can all talk. I think it's important. Um, and this is the thing. It's all about making these connections. I mean, I'm a member of the PDDA. I'm an associated member because I insist on going the whole process instead of just uh, using my mother's name. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, and uh, and I, I made so many friends and contacts, and I, I speak to people in France and in India and Australia, and uh, of course everybody gets their input from their environment. And so we can discuss different things and have different views and still come to the same conclusions when we discuss things and how is this connected, how is this connected, how is, yeah. So actually you've touched on a bigger point there, which is 
the weaponization of science within yes. the industry yeah. and the um, pushing away from and dismissal of the anecdotal. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a shame because I think the science side of things is very important. And I think, um, you know, I, I don't want the science debate to put a fence around us. I think yeah. we should be seeing science as a thing we stand on to look over the fence. I call it forward thinking. It's like, okay. Yes. And obviously we don't want people saying, or oh, did you know this percentage of this happens just out of the blue or quoting yeah. things that are silly. But when we think about what we're looking at here, we're looking at trying to step into the emotional experience of another species. We're trying to understand how they're desperately trying to communicate. There's a great saying, which is the dogs are waiting. I love that because mm. the dogs are waiting, right? For us to work it out. Mm. We can't, we have to have a certain amount of anecdotal. We have to talk. We have to think, actually, do you know what? We're all kind of seeing that. So, and it's almost actually down to us to say to our colleagues in the more academic field, this is what's going on. This is what we're seeing. What do you make of it? Mm. Yeah, Rather exactly, than necessarily exactly. waiting for permission yeah. from the other way around, if that makes sense. What do you, what's your view on that? Uh, and also, uh, when, when you start going into the open, <laughs> Well, that's kind of great. Uh, but I found you because uh, I made a very ill-formulated sentence on some forum and you just grabbed it and said, yes, I want to talk about that. <laughs> and uh, I was so happy. Oh, my gosh. And uh, and also through you, I have found so many people that I start following on Facebook and I start listening to podcasts. And I, I found people I didn't haven't heard about before. Of course, my mom knows everybody and knows what they're doing and everything, but uh, <clears throat> but I didn't. <laughs> and uh, I started listening to people maybe she has dismissed before and found out, wow, they have really evolved since I last heard about them. And somebody I never heard their name. And I uh, I found some really, really good uh, lessons and uh, discoveries in holistic groups, in uh, yeah, free work, and uh, that I didn't really think about before. And I, we do enriched environment, which is almost the same, but but also you pick out snippets here and there, and you just uh, internalize it when you think about it. And yeah, actually that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to use that. And sometimes you feel no that doesn't sit right with me. So we push it aside and I'll look at it later. Maybe when I know more, it will sit better. <laughs> and that's really important again there because <clears throat> there's two components here for me. First of all, that we can only have our own truth. That is what we have. And anybody who listens to anything I talk about, I definitely don't want people to think that I'm trying to say, you must see this way. I just think we all need to hear stuff and think, well, how does that fit with my truth how does it uh, help me to evolve <clears throat> so that's the individual thing you and i as individual people we will see things differently and we'll see some things the same oh, yeah. i think as a um, as a movement as a vision for the future of how we connect with and support and teach dogs mm. the bigger the bigger the entity of people the bigger that truth becomes yes um, so we don't have to have a shared truth that we all buy into. We can have our own individual truths, but there yes. will become a collective truth that we all become part of. Yes. And that's what's really exciting. And I, I just know uh, when I look at um, human psychology, especially human therapy, especially how we connect with children with either communication or learning challenges, um, I see that as a bit of where we're going to end up, I think. I think that that's a vision that I can see us moving to. Uh, the uh, biopsychosocial model that yeah. kind of uh, is quite, has been around for quite a while in psychology and clinical circles. It's kind of, it makes sense, right? That we're not just subject to one component part. There's multiple things that go on that drive our behavior. And I can see that's where we're going, Linda, actually. A, a multi a multidiscipline, multifactorial approach, which will really start to give us those insights. Uh, it's very important that we have a lot of dimensions. I mean, uh, gut bacteria can influence on the hormone that influences the brain to feel <laughs> differently. And uh, the muscles, everything connects with each other. And also, 
the way we connect with the dog and how the dog as an individual connect with us and our living area and how we do things, how we move. I mean, everything is so interconnected. And um, I got so enthusiastic now I almost lost my thread. I have no idea where I'm going at the moment. <laughs> Well, no, but that's good. I, on the on the notion, whilst you whilst you kind of uh, go back on your brain like I had to earlier, mm. uh, the interconnected bit is really important, and I think this is why I like a philosophical approach, which has been poo pooed a little bit um, in recent years. But philosophy is important because individual disciplines will invariably suck you closer and closer in because they yes. just will, whether you're yes. a training geek, a neuroscientist yeah. or whatever. Yeah. The beautiful thing about a philosophical approach is that it invites you to step back yeah. and to just ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And yes. even if they're questions we don't know the answers for, and that's something else I think, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of Q and A's and a lot of stuff that gets thrown at me. I'm like, I have no idea. I, I, I can give you my best guess. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and, and the way the industry has gone in some sectors where it's, very much based on absolutes. Yeah. Uh, that's an odd concept. Well, why wouldn't you? Hang on, you're supposed to be the guy who's talking and you've given a presentation that you don't know the answers. But that's the whole <laughs> point, right? Because yeah. the, the dogs have the answers. Yes, absolutely. Ultimately, we're just trying to work that through. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just have to do a very short pro promo. Uh, dog nose, Sindhoid Pangal in India. It's not out in the the USA or the EU yet. It's coming next year, maybe. But it's it's dog nose, and she's been studying uh, street dogs in India. And Sindor's also work dogs. is really important, isn't it? Yeah. So how come you've got a copy then? <clears throat> well, as I said, I'm a member of the PDTE, <laughs> and as such, I have a lot of connections all it's over the good world. To have connections, you yeah, see, and we, we talk to each other. We send each other emails and messengers, messengers, and uh, everything. And we are on these little groups together, where we talk about specifics like loose leash walking or slow yeah. living, or yeah. I'd love to get Sindor on actually <clears throat> to one of these lives because I think, um, uh, yeah, I think Sindor's um, doing some amazing stuff. And uh, I know she's got the book out. Uh, it looks quite a big book actually. Is it quite a thick yeah. volume? Yeah. Yeah, it's quite. Maybe you should read us a chapter. Not now. <laughs> I want to talk now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But maybe we could have a little bedtime with Linda feature and you could just read us a little story. Um, yeah. <laughs> thinking about some, so just coming up to up to date then with the work you're doing at the moment. Um, where do you, what is it that's exciting you right now? What is the thing either from those around you or what you're experiencing yourself that you think, yeah, that's the thing I'm really. I'm really kind of getting good vibes about and I, I need to want to know more about or I want to do more with. It's uh, using the dog's language to, to help him find his language if he has forgotten or suppressed it because he haven't been allowed to do, use it and to, to help the owner see it and understand it and use it. And uh, I got a lot of flack lately <laughs> because uh, for example, if a dog is jumping and uh, trying to bite my arms, I turn and I give this hand signal and the dog stops. And people are getting angry with me because that is not possible. Uh, yes, I do it all the time with all kinds of dogs. And I don't teach them this. Sometimes I have to do it several times because the dog is too excited to actually, I mean, notice anything around them. Uh, sometimes I have to do it several times because the dog has lost some of his language. Uh, he, they never lose it completely. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, dogs, when they're together, they, they don't go and say, yay, that's good. And they don't, they don't go snarling at each other all the time either. They use their body language and we can use it. And it is so hilarious when the owners get it. And the light that goes up in the owner's eyes when they can do like this and a problem behavior is gone. It's amazing. And the look in the dog's eyes 
when he recognizes this, I say, oh shit. <laughs> So what, what do you think, um, <clears throat> what is the, um, uh, why do you think, because I, I would agree actually that I think a lot of dogs I work with initially they've kind of forgotten or they're not sure about. How it's because to, they have been giving us all these signs all their life and we never understood them. Mm. They've been trying to tell you how they feel for years and we just blatantly ignored it. So with elder dogs, sometimes they give up and sometimes they get so happy when they see that somebody understands them. Yeah. And some dogs seem to connect with me on an almost celestial level just because I understand them. And the dog owners think that maybe I'm communicating on another level, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm just giving them the signs that I understand what they're saying. Do you and think I that's because my opinions? <laughs> do you think that's because <clears throat> your first thing to do is to wait, mm -hmm. rather than the first thing to do is to do? Because a lot of the stuff we tend to do with dogs is I'm going to do something first, yeah. and right. then the dog has to respond to that, rather than right. I'm just going to wait and see what you do first, and then I can respond to you. Mm. No, and um, people are so fixated on doing. We have to do this. We have to do that. Who told you that? Who told you you have to do anything at all? It's, a, it's what we call a fictional social pressure. Do you think we're kind of hardwired into that though? Because even from school yeah. onwards, where we have those pressures put on us at work, family yeah. family connections. You have so, to wear uh, a white shirt on your, on your workplace, for example. Yeah, well, I've got mine on. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm allergic to makeup and I got flack at work as a kindergarten teacher playing in the sandbox that I didn't, wasn't wearing makeup. Hmm. So actually, this way of connecting with dogs, I find myself uh, the way that I practice with uh, my clients, which is about trying to step into the dog's experience and trying to find out those authentic mm. coping mechanisms that the dog invariably has, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> and as you say, managing things enough so that they can have a chance of doing that, because, of course, if that nervous system takes over too much, they struggle to connect to those things but yeah. I, find, I find a lot of the carers clients um it's liberating for them too actually yeah. and you, you um, start from the bottom you, you start with making an environment that is calm and secure and uh, where the dog is able to concentrate and to look so what are the big whys left for you? I know there's many, but at the moment, what are the, what are the current whys in your head that you're thinking, why is that? What's the thing that takes a lot of your thought process up at the moment with the why? Actually, just this moment, it's why do people do that? <laughs> I mean, uh, why are people so reluctant to think Otherwise, I, we just talked about it. It's the same mm. for them as for everybody else. It's safe. But, uh, but we have also to see why is the dog doing what he's doing? Because it makes sense to the dog. Yeah. If he's doing what he's doing because of pain, why does he have pain? Well, maybe it's tense muscles. Well, why is his muscles tense? <laughs> is it because he have an injury? or had an injury earlier that made his muscles tense? Is it because he had an experience that if people stoop over him and pet him, it will be hurtful or make shift his balance? So, so he will snarl at people who come and bend over him. And all these things are connected. And you have to find the root cause. And then you start, fix my dog, he does this. And why does he do that? Why does he do that? And also, why do you want him to do that? Why do you want him to do this? Why do you want to do that? And uh, there are so many whys. They're more mm. wise than there are people. Yeah, and I think this is why it is really interesting when you start peeling away the layers, because even for that dog, that presentation, that behavior, there will be so many strands behind that. A lot of that will have been from, like you said earlier, many years trying to communicate something actually, mm. and not getting that relief. I use the term relief a lot, mm. <clears throat> um, feeling, that no help comes, feeling that there is no 
connection there. And that does have an effect on our neurology and our physiology and, and everything else starts to come together. And so we have to kind of unpick all that. Yeah. Uh, and the need to be understood, the need to communicate. And yeah. that's also interspecies. And this is the thing, we're not very good at communicating our own emotional need, to be honest, and we're not very good at recognizing stress in each other. So there's a there's a lot of things to consider here. And this is why I think going on some of the um, uh, when you have that time for me, it's time and space is everything. Right. So we need time and we need space, not just physical space, but headspace to kind of see stuff Um, only just this afternoon before I came on air with you going out with uh, one of my clients in the environment. Uh, and just seeing the difference in her because she's a very busy lady, corporate lady, walks were very much kind of almost like a power walk, right, mm-hmm. you know, um, and she's really slowed stuff down, seeing the difference in that lady, how she holds herself, mm-hmm. how she breathes. Um, it, it's a two-way thing. When we have that kind of almost symbiotic connection, when we're thinking about, right, we're going <clears> to <throat> be supportive of each other. This is why I like the term alignment because it isn't about letting go of all the stuff we've ever done with dogs it's just recognizing that the dog has to have a say somewhere as well and we're just going to try and find that middle ground you know as best we can yes of course so what before we um think about uh kind of uh right around a blue what are the things that you really want um people to consider uh if you could kind of sum it up into a <clears throat> to a few main points really about the things that we need to be really considering when we're working with our dogs or even just owning a dog and connecting with a dog caring for a dog yeah i think we should think about why we want what we want really meditate on that why do you want the dog to sit <laughs> and uh, what is natural for the dog what does the dog need does he need to be obedient subservient very many people say yes that is a life skill i've heard people say that sit down stay come here roll over jump here is a life skill uh for me it's not but i I really wish people could think it mull it over uh, go into yourself feel it in your heart feel it with your brain and just take some time and think really think try to feel does that resonate with me does it sound right trust your gut feeling a little bit more trust your dog a lot more he's not plotting to take over the world he's not plotting to dominate you or steal your family and uh, your bread and everything he uh, certainly is not going to steal your car like a teenager so <laughs> let him have his little teenage <clears throat> things <laughs> I do think a lot of things we have to think about is because I I think there's two types of dog, isn't there? There's the dog that comes to see us now, the dog that's had to kind of endure all these things that we're not getting right. Yeah. And we have to kind of make some of those compromises along the way to support that dog. But then there is the generational shift that we have to be considering. What are we going to start doing with the new generation, with these puppies? What are we going to do with the kind of, because in the UK, we still have a very heavy reliance upon a structured educational class-like system. You know, sit down, come stay. Um, We we have to think about that side of things as well, don't we? To start Mm. thinking about how we educate carers. I do do only one-on-one. Say again? I do only one-on-one. Yeah. Uh, with puppies anything i will have a social uh, gatherings with puppies like four puppies together playing in a enclosure but th- then i don't butt in at all but if i'm going to teach the dog and the owner i want it one-on-one because otherwise i can't focus enough to concentrate and getting what the owner is thinking and what the dog is thinking of course we're individuals the dogs are individuals we are individuals we all have our own truths as you talking about that's important I, i'm gonna say but i only do one-to-one so i have having said that i've got a um, <clears throat> couple of colleagues lucy and howard <clears throat> who live locally lucy's going to come on and talk to us in the group actually because oh. they do um they do group sessions but they're really re 
re reimagining what these are going to look like. They don't have a formulated structure. They've moved away from that. It is about mm -hmm. teaching observational skills. It is about connections. It is about mm -hmm. trying to work out how that individual puppy processes, what their learning style is, mm -hmm. and allow the puppy, because Mother Nature's pretty good, right? She knows what she's doing. So she would have equipped us and the pups you know, when we're younger with the right kind of formulation to learn mm. what we need to learn if those opportunities are given, right? Yeah. And I think that's where we've got to start thinking about these things. And um, uh, I just noticed one of the comments here, uh, Jill, Jill Breiner. Hi, Jill. Uh, nice to see you. Um, uh, she mentioned a good point here about, I was talking about how we don't even recognize stress, but we're not very good at recognizing body language as such mm. uh, and about how people do things. I think, I think, I think that's a really good point because we've almost because of the stresses, especially in a modern Western world, we've almost forgotten how to do human sometimes, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah. I suck at reading humans. Yeah. Because I don't really care. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, that's I'm okay. sorry. That's okay. well, I'm not that yeah. tuned into your feelings of not hurting you. I'm really concerned about not hurting the dog. <laughs> that's fair enough. I think a lot of people will relate to that, Linda, and it's good to be honest about this stuff. <laughs> um, I'm I'll, trying to I'll, be I'll... polite, though. <laughs> I'll remember not to contact you when I'm having a bad day because I might not get the sympathy there. So that's fair. Um, well, if you're just <laughs> talking about you, maybe I can find the sympathy. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, great. So, Linda, uh, what have you got coming up? How can people? Well, make sure any kind of links for things we can stick in the in the comment section. So there's things there, and by all means, have a, a read through things afterwards, Linda, and uh, and as I say, put a post in there with things. But what are, yeah. what's coming up for you? What are you going to be doing? And uh, how can people find out more about what you're doing? And what projects have you got coming up? Yeah, well, mostly I work in Norwegian, which is my native tongue. And uh, now we have this uh, center called Hunelan, or Dog World, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and we're just building it up, my mother, my co co-worker and me, I, <laughs> sorry, and um, and also my friend, my co-worker and I, we go to Oslo on the other side of the country uh, on occasion to have some courses there, some lectures, some one-on-one -on -one and some loosely training and some problem solving. And also I'm still taking classes. I'm still on dog trainer school level three. And um, oh, I'm planning on taking more classes. And uh, it's all about evolving. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm getting old, but- <laughs> Older, I think we can say yeah, older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe that was so nice. Yeah. But uh, I was thinking if I really, really want to sum everything up, it is before man, dog did not have behavioral issues that's a really good way of framing it because when we think about dysregulation you don't see dysregulation in mother nature you just don't because uh, it's a human thing and because we're so in conflict with our emotions and what to do and mm -hmm. how to think and we've mm -hmm. kind of passed that on to our companion animal yeah really. yeah uh, what's it like in Norway? What, what's the dog culture in Norway? Uh, is it quite progressive, quite forward-thinking, quite traditional? It's very, very divided. Hmm. Uh, we don't have very aversive uh, training. Uh, I mean, e-collars and prong collars are banned. Uh, we still have choke collars, though, but not so much. Hmm. Um, and uh, we have mixed trainers. Uh, we have... Uh, of course, the R plus positive uh, trainers, and uh, but Norwegians are very active people. There's a lot of dog sports. It's carnicross and it's kick biting, biking, and it's running and it's climbing mountains every weekend. I know people who climb a mountain every day before they go to work. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. yeah, for two hours or something like that. Yeah. I mean, Norwegians are insane about exercising. And uh, unfortunately, some people, they don't stop to think about the length of the dog's legs. A chihuahua has legs like that. No, maybe that. And when you walk fast, he has to run for dear life to keep up with you. Yeah. Of course he does. He doesn't want to lose you. 
Mm. And of course he sees you're happy when he's running for their life. So he's happy to please you. But if you take the time to slow down and walk so slowly that the dog can walk, first of all, he's going to stress down. He's going to sniff and lower his pulse rate. And also he will develop his deeper and inner muscles and get a better balance. Mm. And if a dog can't walk, then he's either too stressed or he's already out of balance. Yeah, that's a whole different you talk. And actually, um, just yeah. talking about the slowing down thing, just to let people know, um, I haven't put it up yet, uh, which I'm going to probably do over the weekend, but we've got um, Laura Dobb and Penny Clayton mm -hmm. coming in to talk from yeah. the slow dog uh, yeah. movement, because uh, that's going to be really... Really that's why I well. stayed away from that topic now because I know they're going to take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well, we must have you back again, Linda. There's, there's so many things I've, I've I've been making notes. I've been talking, and I and I've only covered a few bits and pieces. There's so many things there, and um, uh, and I think uh, noise on our list of places we'd like to visit. Actually, so you never know, we might get a chance to to kind of meet up in the not too distant future. So oh, yeah, um, that would be great. That's one for I have a site actually in visit Christian soon about my hometown and all the sightseeing around here. So cool. I'm going to do an eagle safari tomorrow with another dog trainer. <laughs> wow. I don't worry, I'll, I'll, if we, because my husband and I, we've got our little places we want to go kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, you'll definitely be my person to at least find out where to go. And I might even just kind of pin you down and get you to give us a, a day where you can show us around a bit, who knows. Oh yeah, oh, I would love that. And if ever you come to Devon, I'll get you a cream tea. All right, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, I'll, and I'll show you around, Devon. Uh, <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much, Linda, for tonight. Um, yeah. uh, we've, we've, uh, I've really enjoyed speaking to you, and, and we must do this again. But uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Oh, I had a ball. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank <laughs> okay. you, Linda. Bye. Uh, everybody, Rachel Leather is coming in to talk to us. Uh, Rachel's a, a specialist on trauma. It's going to be great. That's this Sunday. Uh, I think it's four o'clock, but have a look. That's going to be another good one for us. But uh, uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, speak to you soon.